In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we'll be starting in verse 3 and reading through verse 5. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, we come before you today, God, and we thank you once again that we can gather here in your name and know that where two or more gathered, you are there. Father, I pray, God, that you would use me this morning, hide me behind the cross, wash me with the blood of Jesus, that I may be clean before you, Father. And Jesus, this morning, speak through me. In Jesus' name, amen. New Year always seems to, like I said, uh, remind us of the past, but it also reminds us of our future and where we want to go. And oftentimes we make resolutions few we keep. And as we reflect over our life this morning, I wonder how many of you would say, why do I think the way I think? What's wrong with me? How did my life get where it is? Why, why is it that I cannot seem to get my life under control? I try to change, but I simply can't change. And for most of us, what's happened in our lives is these habits that we have have many times become strongholds. And many times we try to cover those strongholds or we try to hide them, but they're there. And the reason uh, things in our life becomes compulsions or addictions or strongholds is because it sort of sneaks up on us. You know, no child uh, ever thinks, you know, I cannot wait one day to grow up and become an alcoholic. No child is out there playing and around and thinking, well, one day I cannot wait till I grow up and I can find me the perfect woman so I can get a divorce. No child grows up thinking, you know, I can't wait until one day uh, I find myself, I grow up and I can become a man and go to jail. Those are not dreams that we have of as children. And yet many of us have been through life situations and circumstances that when we arrived there, we thought to ourselves, how in the world did I get to where I am? What happened? Because you see, it doesn't happen all at once. It's not an eruption, but it's an erosion that we battle. You see, it's not something that happens to us. It's sort of like a sabotage. Our enemy sabotages us. He doesn't blitzkrieg us. You can, uh, I know some of you have maybe seen the cartoon or maybe sometime you think, you know, there's a devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other shoulder and they're whispering into my ear and the one I listen to is the one, uh, you know, that that I'm going to follow. But I think that there's not just one voice that whispers in my ear. There are many voices. And I hear them a lot of times. And some of you are going to say, well, that's why you need to go to this hospital that we know and get some help. But... In reality, there are many voices that we hear, right? I mean, there's the voice, uh, uh, if you see an attractive, this is for a man now, I guess. If you see an attractive woman walking down the street, your mind, something in your mind goes, wow, that's an, that's an attractive woman. And then all of a sudden, there's another voice in your mind that says, uh-huh, boy, I would like to talk to that woman. If I could just talk to that woman for a minute. And then there's another voice in your mind goes, boy, if your wife ever finds out that you try to talk to that woman, good thing your wife can't read your mind. And then there's another voice that jumps in and says, ho, 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 bro, hold on now. You, uh, you know, if, if your wife looked like that, you would never let her out of the bed. And then there's a final voice, the voice of reason that says, oh, shut up, dude. If your wife looked like that, she would not have married you. <clears throat> so, you know, there's, there's all these voices <clears throat> that are constantly uh, competing in my head. And what uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, he once said, he said, you sow a thought and you reap an action. You sow an action, then you reap a habit. You sow a habit, then you reap a character. You sow a character and you reap a destiny. You see, the enemy's coming against us trying to destroy our lives, trying to destroy our hopes, and trying to destroy our dreams. And if we just knew that was him, 
You know, if we just knew that this little decision that I'm about to make, this little thought that's, that's flowing through my mind is going to lead to an action that's going to lead to another action that's going to lead to a habit that's going to lead to a character that's going to lead to a destiny, then I would have stopped it. But it's an erosion, isn't it? It's not an explosion. It just happens slowly. And we look up one day and we go, how in the world did I get here? How in the world did I get so caught up in all of this? You see, the way we think dictates what we do. Now, I know that living in the South, if you really believed, if you really thought in your mind it's going to snow tomorrow, and you were convinced in your mind that it was going to snow tomorrow, I know what you would do. You would go out and get you some milk and bread today. Because uh, you, you, we know that a lot of people in Tennessee die each year during a snowstorm because they don't have milk and bread. So we want to make sure that we get that, don't we? My point being, if you really believe a certain way, it affects your actions. Is that correct? Of course it is. And if you believe this morning that you are unworthy, it affects your actions. If you believe this morning that you are unloved, it affects your actions. It makes you act unworthy. It makes you act unloved. If you really believe this morning that you don't need church, then you won't come. If you really believe this morning that you do need church, you'll be here. I think one of the reasons that so many miss church is because they don't believe it's really relative or, and that missing church doesn't really impact our life. You see, what if everyone in this morning who's here believed in their heart of hearts that if they came this morning, God was going to speak a word to them and was going to change their lives by them being here today? How would that impact our church <clears throat> How would that impact our life if we really thought that when we came in here, God was going to speak to us and change our lives? But unfortunately, we don't. We don't really believe that. We do not connect our thoughts of, that they, they affect our everyday decisions and our everyday decisions affect our destiny. Do you understand that? We don't understand that the smallest decisions that we make have sort of a ripple effect, a butterfly effect that begins to affect our whole lives and it determines our destiny. Our lives are affected by the way we think more than they are affected by the major decisions that we make. I want to say that again. Our lives are affected more by the way we think than they are by the major every by the decisions major decisions that we make because you see the way we think determines the major decisions that we make if you think you're not good enough or you're not pretty enough to get the man or the woman so therefore it determines your destiny if you think that you're not smart enough to go to school or to obtain a skill then you won't do that if you think that your God is not strong enough to help you overcome your addictions or your compulsions, then you will never overcome your addictions or compulsions. If you think that you're not spiritual enough to do a ministry in the church, then you'll never do a ministry in the church. If you think that you want to try something, but you're too afraid because you think you'll fail, then you'll never try it. We got to understand that the battle begins in the mind. Do you understand that Satan and the world are seeking to destroy your life? It's seeking to stop you from fulfilling your potential. That's why Jesus says that he came to give you life and to give you abundant life. He came to give you life that's rich and overflowing with joy and peace. And yet most who call themselves Christians never truly experience joy and peace. Why? Because they are not understanding that the battle, and the Bible talks about it over and over again, the battle is in the mind. It's in the mind. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 7, verse 14. In Romans chapter 7, verse 14, let me find it here. Romans 7, verse 14. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do it. But what I hate, that I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree the law is good. But it is no longer I myself who do it, but sin living in me. In me. For I know that no good thing in itself dwells in me. That is in my sinful nature. For I have a desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. 
For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. How many of you can relate to that? Now Paul goes on and he gives a solution to this problem. And I'm going to try to give you a solution that the Bible gives us for this problem. But the truth is, many times we are doing what we don't want to do. And Paul says there's a reason. He says the reason is we are battling against a sinful nature for our mind. Now, Paul tells us that, that we have a sinful nature that battles. A sinful nature is an inclination within us to do that which is not right. And all of us have it. David says in the book of Psalms that he was conceived and born in sin. I want you to understand this. Listen to me. I am not a sinner because I sin. I sin because I'm a sinner. I want you to get that. Your very nature desires sin. Your very nature, your inclination is to do what God doesn't want you to do. You see, that's built in us. It is passed on to us from our parents. We do, why do we sin? We sin because that's what we do. That's what sinners do. If you can wash a pig, you can take a pig into your house, you can wash him up, you can put a bow in its hair. But the fact is, as soon as you let that pig out the door, what's that pig gonna do? He's gonna run to the mud. Because that's what pigs do. We would expect nothing less. And let me say this to you. We sin because we are sinners. That is our inclination. That is our nature. And without Christ, without the supernatural, we will run to sin. It battles for our mind. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, it says the three things that battle for our mind is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Lust is the desire to do that which is forbidden. It's an inclination in us. We simply desire it. There's times if we, if we can get away with it, we'll do it. If we think we won't get caught, we'll do it. It is a built-in craving inside of us. It's passed down from generation to generation, father to son, mother to daughter. It is coded in your DNA. It is reinforced by your upbringing and your environment. We crave the forbidden fruit and desire what we do not or cannot have. And listen to this, and I believe it's true. And we're ungrateful for what we do have. We're ungrateful for the blessings that we have and only grieve for those blessings when they're gone. Even our own health and our life, we only grieve it after it's gone. Because of our pride, we thought ourselves deserving of good things and blessings. And we thought we earned them by our attractiveness and goodness. And we blame God and we feel that we're like we're cursed when we don't get exactly what we want when we want it. We're like spoiled children at Christmas. My granddaughter is definitely a spoiled child on her way to it. She gets so many gifts. We get, we, my, my wife had so many gifts under the tree. So what she would do is she would unwrap a gift and as soon as she got that one torn, she never even looked at the present, a quick glance and grabbed the other gift and began to tear it open, looking for, for what else she has. And you know what I determined after it was all over? There was not one gift that truly satisfied because she was looking for another. Where's another one? Where's another one? So she began to open mine. We're like that, aren't we? It's never enough. You have your health, you have your, your family, you have people that love you, you have a church, you have so much going for you, yet it's not enough, is it? We're always looking for more. We're always craving more. It's in our very nature. When we don't get it, we fight for it, or we manipulate others to get it. And when somebody else has it, we want it. And so we get jealous or we try to uh, get angry or depression fills our heart because we're not getting what we think we deserve. And let me say this, Christian, anything above hell is grace because every single one of us in this room deserve hell if for nothing else because of our sinful inclinations that we cannot change on our own. I was at uh, Bass Pro yesterday. And man, as soon as I walked in there, my eyes lit up. Look at that four-wheeler. I need that four-wheeler. Man, look at that side-by-side. -side. I need that side-by-side. -side. And my wife's going, you won't even ride it. You had a, a four-wheeler you never rode. You sold it to William Spencer for $250 after you put $3,000 in it. 
because you never wrote it. But I need it. I, you don't understand. I need that four wheeler. You know what? Our, all of our needs are nothing more than pride in my life thinking I deserve it. It thinks I deserve it. After all, we've been good boys and girls and we've earned our keep and we deserve good things and why not get what we want? Isn't that the reason many of us are in such unbelievable debt? It's because we deserved it. I work hard for my money. I need that and I'm going to buy it. And so we get ourselves in such debt that we cannot give to the kingdom of God and we cannot really feed those who are really hungry and we cannot financially meet the needs of those who are really in need because we're feeding the fat man. True. Appetites grow through indulgence. You know, we, 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 we crave things, don't we? And we crave things and we think, I'm just hungry for that. You know, I just need that. I, I, I'm hungry for that. My appetite, can't you see how bad I need that? Do you not realize that not only do people who are, who are starving crave food, but gluttons also? Because we are so blessed, our appetites grow through indulgence. Another thing that battles against our minds are the forces of evil. Paul says it this way in Ephesians 5, 6, 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Sometimes the battle for our mind does not come from within, but it comes from without. There, are, there is evil in this world. We are born into an evil world. Let me say this to you. There are times in my life I've questioned the existence of God but I'm not sure I've ever questioned the existence of the devil there is an evil that is present in this world and we see it and many times feel it come against us it may not come in the in, in the form of a devil with a pitchfork and horns but it comes there are people that are influenced by demonic forces and so they they influence our lives the forces of evil wage war against you and they come sometimes in the form of possession or oppression, but many times they come in by way of people and sexual or physical or emotional abuse. It may be even rejection or divorce. You cannot help what happens to you as a child. What happened to you? And you many times cannot happen, uh, help what's happening to you as an adult. You cannot help where you were born. You cannot help the color of your skin. You cannot help how you were raised. As a child of God, evil does come to us, but let me say this as a child of God, evil may come to us, but evil does not define us. You see, if you're a child of God, we are not victims. We are not even survivors. We are victors. We can overcome evil by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And like Joseph once said to his brothers who plotted to murder him, who sold him into slavery, and after years of imprisonment, one day they stood before Joseph, who is now a prince, and he looked at these men who had sold him into slavery, and he said to them, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. To bring about many people should be kept alive as they are here today. Do you understand this, folks? If you're a child of God, if you're a Christian this morning, God is a lover of great comebacks. He loves raising folks from the dead. He's a God of the underdog, a miraculous deathbed raiser who takes people who have been beat up and rises them up. He is a God who takes people who are down and out and turns them into up and coming. I remember just a few years ago, on this day, I was sitting in a jail cell in an orange jumpsuit. The night before, I'd traded my bologna sandwich for some pills. I didn't even know what they were. And I was throwing pills into my mouth. Didn't even know what they were. Just to make it through the day. Just to try to sleep it off. Because I couldn't stand the prison that I was in. I couldn't stand the hell that my life had become. And I lay there on that bed and I wondered how in the world did I get here? But today I can honestly say to you and I never thought I would say it. I am glad 
that I went to jail. I am glad that I went through what I went through because had I not gone through it, I would not be standing before you today. God is a, is a one that loves raising folks from the dead. Greg Bailey, you may not be here today had I not been in jail 10 years ago and have come to have a, God uses my story and God can use your story no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done. So today, it's a time to change. Today, we need to tilt our head a bit. Change may take time. It may come slowly, but the fact is, it has a beginning point. It has a moment that the process begins. Now, for you this morning, the Bible told us what that beginning point was. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, he says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, and he talks about strongholds in our life. And then he says the first thing we do is we take every thought captive. I want you to understand that. The battle is for the mind. Now, I used to have records, and some of you young folks in here don't know what I mean by a record. And I don't mean a jail record. Now, I'm meaning a record that plays on a phonograph. And I used to play that phonograph. Now, I, I was not one of those people like some I know who really took care of their phonograph records. I mean, I got through with that record. I just toss it over there and put me another record on. I just pile them on top of each other, never put them in their sleeve. So, man, the next time I listen to that record, it would have a scratch on it. And every time that, th that, that needle hit that scratch, it would back up and say the same thing over and over and over again. And there was no way for me to remove that scratch from my, that record. I kept hearing it over and over again. What thought is it that keeps playing over and over in your mind? Where's the scratch on your record? What does it keep going back to and telling you who you are and what you can do? Now what you have to do is you need to listen to that voice. You need to hear what that record, what that voice is saying to you. Is it saying you're unworthy? Is it saying you're unlovable? Is it saying you're an addict? Is it saying you're an alcoholic? Is it saying you're worth nothing, that you're beyond hope and beyond any help? Whatever that voice is saying to you, listen to it and then grab it. And hold it captive. Don't let it go. Hold that thought and hold it captive and then give it to Jesus. Give that thought and compare it to what God has to say about it. Listen to me, folks. This is so important because whatever thought it is that's dictating your everyday decisions, take it captive and then compare it to what God really says about it. Because I asked a guy the other day, he was talking about all this junk, talking about his life and talking about his thoughts. And I said, where's that thought coming from, brother? He's like, what? I said, where's that thought coming from? God never says that about you. God never says that about you. Where's that thought coming from? He said, I've never thought about it. I said, if it's not coming from God, it's either coming from the world or it's coming from Satan, but it's not coming from God. Second thing you need to do is immerse yourself into the word of God. You need to know what God says about you. You need to know, immerse yourself into the word of God. Find out what God says. And when the thought comes to you, you're able to rebuke that thought and say, that's not what God says. God says you're unlovable. I mean, somebody or your thoughts say you're unlovable and unworthy, right? Here's what God says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. For God so loved you. The Bible says what can separate us from the love of God? Can sword or famine or peril? Nothing in all creation can separate you from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you not understand that? You are worth Christ going to the cross and dying for. Even in your most sinful nature. While we were yet sinners, Christ went to the cross and died for you. Why? To show you first of all of all that he loves you and secondly that sin is destroying your life and you can begin again do not conform to the pattern of this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind you renew your mind when you immerse yourself in the word of God read it and you know what I'm not sitting here saying that you got to open up your Bible every day but you need to be reading something with the word of God in it every day you need to be reading a book 
positive. Paul says to whatever is good, whatever is beautiful, whatever is uplifting, think upon these things. This is what we need to immerse ourselves in. We have to change and renew our minds. Another thing we have to do to win this battle is we have to find a brother or sister. We have to find somebody that we trust. God will lead, them, lead you a brother or sister. The Bible says in James chapter 5, verse 16, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So we got to find somebody who we can pray with. we got to find somebody who will encourage us. we got to find somebody who will sometimes rebuke us. You understand that? you got to find somebody who's honest with you. you got to find a brother or sister who will pray with you, but who will also be honest with you. And in other words, you got to find a brother or sister who will sometimes go in, Greg, that's so stupid. That's crazy. Do you hear what you just said? You got to sometimes, you got to find a brother or sister who calls you on your stuff. But you need somebody you can share your thoughts, your disappointments, and your failures with. Lastly, you need to find a church. Church has got a bad rap. Man, I, there's people you talk to them about coming to church. I don't want to go to church. Well, I understand that. I do. I, I promise you I understand that. But church has got a bad rap because, see, we think of church as a religious institution. But the word church in the Bible actually simply means the word assembly or community. And so when I say you need to find a church, I'm saying you need to find an assembly that you can go to. You need to find a group of people who support you. I don't care whether it's Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, you need to find a group of people that support you where you can assemble. Now, I'm going to take it a bit further. And I'm going to say Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous are good things. But they lead you to God. But the real God is Jesus Christ. And so you need the Holy Spirit in your life. you got to come and find that the true God is Jesus Christ who can give you that peace and that victory that you need. But you need to surround your, yourself with people who have your best interest at heart. Now you say, Brother Wade, I, does that really work? Well, let me tell you, how did you get where you are? Most of us got where we are because of the people, places, and things, right? The people we hung out with. The places we went. The things we did. And if we want to win the battle for our mind, we've got to ch change people, places, and things. And one of the first ways to start is find you a support group. And I hope that our church is becoming that. I hope that Victory Baptist Church is becoming a support group to help people overcome sin and overcome defeat and overcome depression because that's what the church was called to do. You've had people in your life that every time you tried to climb out of the pit, they pulled you back in. It's time to have some people in your life that help you out of that pit. And that's what we're called to do. That's what a child of God is. Tracy knows that, don't you? Her car broke down. Power steering pump out. All these people, I'm going to come do your power steering pump for you, Tracy. I'll be over there. I'm going to come here. So she sat there for day after day after day after day. Couldn't go nowhere over Christmas. Power steering pump out. I kept telling her, you got to call the brother. You got to call the brother. Quit depending on people of the world. Call the brother. Call the brother. I'm not calling him. I'm not. I don't know what to say. So finally, I finally got home from Nashville and I said, I'll call the brother. And I called the brother. And he went out there yesterday on that cold day, drove up to her house, and changed out her power steering pump. You know why, Tracy? He wouldn't accept a dime for it, would he? He tried. You know why he did that? Because that's what brothers do. And I knew he was going to do that because I know his character. And that's what brothers do. We care about one another. That's why you need a brother. That's why you need a sister. And I'm not going to mention his name because I'm going to let you have that reward, brother, in heaven. But that's what we do. It took years to get where you are. And you're not going to change immediately. It doesn't happen overnight. 
It took years to get where you are, and it'll take time to get where you want to go. Because life is a journey, not a destination. It's the everyday journey, the everyday walk. And as I said, change takes time, but it begins with a thought. It begins with a decision. And I'm going to say to you today, sow a thought, and you'll reap a destiny. Simply change your mindset. Today you can stop the direction you are going and turn toward God. That's simply called repentance. If you are haunted by the past, thinking the things you have done cannot be forgotten or not be forgiven, today you can stop and capture that thought and say, no more, I'm going home. Today you can make a decision to do the next right thing. And soon, what's going on right now will be your past. Do you get that? If you're so worried about your past and you don't feel like you can get away from your past, start doing the next right thing today and soon your present will become your past because time doesn't stop. The calendar flips over and over again. You have to make a decision, though, to turn your will and your life over to God, to turn it over to Christ, and I'm going to ask you to make that decision right now. And you say, Brother Wade, I'm not going to make no decision today. I'm not. I'm going to think about it. But I'm not going to make a decision. If you walk out of here today, listen to me. I'm about to close. You walk out of here today and you say, I didn't make a decision. Yes, you did. You said no. It's a dangerous place to be in church, isn't it? Because you are confronted with a decision every single time. You have no excuse when you stand before the throne of God. You've heard God's word. And so you have no excuse. You, say, you can't say, God, I didn't know. Because now you know. And now you're accountable for what you know. I'm going to ask you today to make that decision. Would you stand with me? With every head bowed and every eye closed, today you can turn your life over to God. You can turn it over to Christ. And you can find that joy and that peace. Now your life is not going to drastically change immediately. So for some they do. <clears throat> but for many it takes a while. Because they've had so many thought patterns in their lives that God has to flush out. It takes a while. That's called sanctification. But it does begin with a decision. Will you begin that journey today? And I'm going to ask you if you would, with every head bowed and every eye closed, who would say to me today, Brother Wade, your, that word that you gave today spoke to my heart. And I want to begin anew with Christ. I want to give my heart and my life over to God this morning. With every head bowed and every eye closed, would you just slip up your hand and say, pray with me as I give my heart and my life to Christ. I want to know more about Jesus, and I'm going to surrender it to him today. Anyone?